This video is an introduction to Python classes. Classes are structured in a similar way to functions where we first have to build a definition for them and then we later instantiate them. Um, so this instantiation is going to construct one instance of the object class. The reason why this is useful is because we can then build one particular definition and instead of just like a function storing operations inside of that, uh, definition and then later calling it to be able to repeat that operation, a class can actually store properties that only pertain to the particular instance of that class. When I'm thinking about this early on, um, it, it can be really hard to kind of conceptualize abstractly. So what I like to do instead is build example scripts that relate to things that we can kind of understand. So what we'll do is build up a, a sample class, which is going to look at the case of a particular person or instance of a given class, which we'll say is humans. To start using Python, just like in previous videos, we're going to go to the toolbar on the top, select Tools, Python Script, and Edit and open a new Python script. With our new Python script open, we can go ahead and get started building our classes. As in previous videos, um, to start, we can leave a multi-line comment for ourselves saying introduction to Python classes. And if we needed to store additional data, we could do that as well in this multi-line comment. Then we can hit enter inside of our script. And since we won't be using Rhino geometry for this particular introduction video, we won't need to import our Rhino script syntax library. So typically we would um, since we are operating inside of Rhino, but in this example, we're just gonna look at the structure of the class itself so we don't need to get into that. In the two subsequent videos, we will get into classes interacting with Rhino geometry, um, and we'll actually be able to build that up and visualize it inside of the script using the Rhino script syntax library. But for now, we're just gonna look at the kind of raw Python structure um, by itself inside this script editor. To start with classes, we first need to define the class. To define a class, you type C-L-A-S-S, -S, so class, lowercase, space, and then the name of our class. So in this case, we're going to make a class human, followed by a colon, and then enter. Now, just like a, a function is kind of defined first, right? So we're, we're using not D-E-F to define a function, but C-L-A-S-S, -S, class to define a class of a given name. Convention says that we should capitalize the name of this to identify it as the class rather than a function. Inside of this, we can store, as I mentioned, a number of properties or functions or what are called methods when they're inside of a class. So for now, we can just leave a note to ourselves to store properties and methods inside of this class. Then we also need inside of here below our comment, um, just a note to pass this or skip whatever is inside because Python is going to expect something to happen. So if we just leave this blank, it's going to give us an error. So instead we can say pass and then below this class, we need to construct it. So just like with functions where we call a function to actually use it, so we define it first and then we can call it however many times we need to, with classes, we will construct a class to build that unique instance or unique kind of identity of that class. Um, so think person in class human. Um, so you might say Patrick in class human, one particular instance of the class. I have my own unique properties and right, methods or functions that I may um, perform. We all may share the property types. Uh, we may share the uh, kind of methods embedded, but uh, we all have our own unique um, individual identity. So it's very similar in this case with uh, class constructs and the instances of them. So to be able to do anything with a class, we need an instance of that class. We can go ahead and uh, kind of debug this or visualize this for ourselves by using a print statement. And then just like functions, we need to call or construct or instantiate uh, that class with a call of its name and then open and close parentheses. 
Now if I click play, we see this printout in our console at the bottom. main.humaninstance.at and a bunch of zeros and then 2c. This is a part of our main script and it's a human class that exists with inside of it. And it's not the class itself, but it's actually just an instance of that class. So we can place a breakpoint on line 10, click play, and what we see pop up here is our name of our class human. We can see that it has a value of old style class human. So it's just giving uh, some information about what type of class it is inside of this Python file. It's a value class human and the name is human. As I mentioned in the analogy, if, if we wanted to refer to a particular person, let's say of class human, what we need to do is name that person. Um, so we need to give an, an instance name to be able to refer to that individual name rather than just generically say human. This way we can refer to the particular properties or methods of that particular person um, in this case. And again, this is just an analogy so that we can kind of wrap our heads around what the use of uh, these classes might actually be. So instead of just printing human here, we can set this to a variable and I'm gonna name this first variable, um, if we stop, I'm gonna name this Patrick. Now I can print Patrick, hit play, and we can see that we still have the same printout here, main human instance, but this number has now changed. So we've already run this script. So we've already constructed an instance. So we're now constructing a different instance. So this is another instance of that same class. This time we've stored it in the variable Patrick. So when we print Patrick, we're referring to that instance stored in the variable. If we click on the breakpoint to drop it at line 11 and then click play, first we construct the class and that's name human value class human and type class object, uh, which is the actual definition of the class. So this happens on line five. And then we have below that name Patrick value instance of human type instant. So on line 10 there, we're constructing not the class itself, but we're constructing an instance of that class. Again, an easy way to think of this is one particular person in the class human. We use our names to refer to each other uh, so here we're going to do the same thing and give it a name so we can refer to it later. And in this case in Python, that name is called a variable. So we're storing that instance inside of a name variable. If we wanted an additional person or an additional identity of this class, then we can just duplicate this and go ahead and change the name. Again, stop debugging and remove the breakpoint, hit enter. We can copy this and then just change this name. So we'll just make a second instance of the class by setting that class instance equal to whatever name we want to use. So I'll just use Sarah. And then we can print Sarah. Now when I hit play, we get two printouts, both an instance of the class human. We can see that this number is different for both of those. So they're different instances of that class. If I click to set a breakpoint and hit play to debug, we can see we now have an instance called Patrick and an instance called Sarah. Where this becomes useful is when we start to store properties inside of each one of these. So I might have certain different properties than Sarah, um, but we might have the same property types. So this is kind of how this is structured where the class human has similar categories that we all may have different particular features in. Um, so inside of the class structure, we structure the types of properties that are stored. But then in the instance themselves, we, we store our particular features or our particular properties. So to do this, I'm gonna copy lines five through 14. And then we can select all of that, comment it out, and then just below this, I'm going to leave a break line for us, just in a comment. And then paste that class object, uh, as well as the two instances of that class. For now, 
I'll remove the Sarah instance, and we can just focus on uh, this one particular instance of this class, Patrick, to kind of debug what is actually happening inside of the class, and then we'll look um, later at examples uh, kind of bringing back this other instance of the class. Um, so inside of the class, I'm going to remove that pass, and now we'll actually do something inside of it. One thing we might do inside of a class is store a particular property, as I mentioned, and we do that by setting a variable. So let's say we have a variable eye color, and we want to set this equal to uh, blue, which we can just make it blue as a string. And uh, then inside of this class, we just want to print that eye color variable. And then below here, just to show the difference, I'm going to print just human. We'll store one instance of uh, the human class in the variable Patrick. And then we'll print Patrick just to take a look at that. So I'm going to hit play. And we can see what happens is first, when we construct the class, it actually reads in that property eye color equals blue and then prints eye color. So it prints that variable and we see blue show up in our console and then it steps down to line 27. It prints one instance of that class. Then it stores the next instance under the variable Patrick and then we print that on line 29. So that's what we're seeing in our console here. If we wanted to print specifically the eye color related to Patrick, we can delete this first print statement because we just want to store the instance under the variable Patrick. And we can also delete this print eye color inside of our uh, class constructor. So instead of just printing Patrick, which would give us the instance of the class, we can refer to that property by placing a period and then that variable name. So Patrick.iColor, we should be able to access that eye color variable. And now when I click play, we're printing that eye color still, but this time it's not happening inside of the class constructor. It's happening outside of the class, referring to that particular variable stored in the instance Patrick. Now, if we then made an additional instance, again, let's just say Sarah, and then we said we wanted to get Sarah's eye color, so we'll print Sarah's eye color here and then hit play. We just get blue for both. And that's because we're actually setting the, the definition, uh, storing the data or setting the data of that variable or that property in the class inside of the constructor. So there's no way of changing what eye color I have versus what eye color someone else has. Um, so in order to do that, we need to operate on this class. So we need to be able to input information into the class. <clears throat> if we tried to do that here by inputting um, some eye color variable, we would get an error because we don't actually have a way of passing this information into our class. I'm going to copy these lines here and then comment them out and then paste below. So now with this pasted down, we're going to need to build out a way that we can input data into our class. We're going to do this with what's called a constructor function. So the first thing that we're going to do is build a constructor function. I'm going to change this comment to ourselves and now say build a constructor function. And we can actually make this even more specific for ourselves and give us that reminder of how to build a function by saying define a constructor function. Now this is particular syntax, which will run by default when we call the class. Um, so it's very similar to what we had, where when we call that class, it automatically runs um, anything that is stored outside of a function. Um, so just tabbed in this open space. So we ran iColor, we had that stored as a property, and we could refer to it. Now, the alternate way, which allows us to actually input data, to create a function. And here we have to define this function if we want it to run as a constructor function as exactly. So we don't get to change this. Um, otherwise, it will not run by default. So we need to exactly write 
underscore underscore i n i t for init underscore underscore open parentheses and now if we just close parentheses hit colon and enter we have a constructor function set what we need is not just uh, information or variables here that we can read in data from outside of this class or outside of this particular constructor function. But for classes themselves, we also need a reference to the class itself. So you can think of this like if I were to refer to myself, I use words like myself. So I would say, oh, like I have, uh, you know, whatever, I have this color eyes. Similar to that, um, similar to that kind of linguistic setup inside of our classes, we need to also refer to ourselves when we're inside of a function. So when we're outside of it here and we just had eye color, we don't, we don't need to refer to ourselves. But when we go inside of a particular function, we need to kind of remind this function that this function is nested inside of a larger class and we need to pass in that instance of ourselves into this function so that it can remember, okay, I am in this class, I have an instance called self, and this lets us store individual properties inside of uh, each unique instance of the class. So to do this, we put in the parentheses a variable called self. And just like the underscore, underscore, init, underscore, underscore, we need to refer to this specifically as self, this is going to give us the access to this class instances self, which means that when we construct other functions, we can refer to this, this identity when we're inside of the class. Another way to maybe think of this is that when we're outside of the class, we just call it by its name, right? So we would call it Patrick or Sarah or whatever the name might be. So the name of that instance is used outside of the class. Inside of the class, we don't, we don't refer to ourselves necessarily. I don't, I don't say Patrick has X eye color, right? We don't, we don't say that type of language. Typically we say um, I have, right? Cause we're referring to ourselves. So similarly inside of the class, when we're referring to ourselves inside of it, we would just say self and outside of it, we refer to the particular name identifying that particular instance. To define this constructor function, we need DEF space underscore underscore INIT underscore underscore self inside of parentheses and then a colon and whatever we want to perform in or store inside of this constructor function. This function is gonna run anytime we build an instance of the class human. So if we tab in this eye color property and we try to hit play and run this, we're gonna get an error that says human instance has no attribute eye color. That's because the variable eye color is now nested inside of the function init, the constructor function. So anytime we're inside of a function, we need to return, refer to the class itself. So it's now not eye color, it's this instance, this instance's property eye color. So we need to refer to it as self.eyeColor, just like we're referring to Patrick.eyeColor here, but inside of the function, we refer to it as self, as I mentioned before. So self.icolor equals blue. Now, if we click play, we can see that just like without the init function, we're performing the same operation of constructing two instances of the class, which, and then we're storing property icolor, and we're setting that equal to blue when we instantiate the class. If we wanna change this property, we could change this property by setting or adjusting the variable outside of the class. So I can say Patrick dot eye color, referring to that particular instance, Patrick, the property inside of that class eye color, which right now is blue. And then we can set this equal to green as a string. Now, if I again print Patrick dot eye color, we now get a printout of blue the first time we print what Patrick's eye color is. Then we change that property. And then when we print it again, we get an output of green. However, Sarah's eye color is still set to blue. If we wanted to change Sarah's eye color, what we would need to do is say Sarah dot eye color equals, 
And then we could change this to some other color, let's say brown, and then print color. So now we have blue, green, blue, brown. That's because the default eye color is blue in this particular example. It could be whatever we wanted to say, uh, just a string. Um, and then we change that for each instance of the class. So Patrick gets green eyes and Sarah gets brown eyes. So we can go ahead and delete this initial print statement that just has the default values here. And next, we can actually add additional properties. We aren't limited to just one property inside of these classes, but we can make additional properties like let's say self.age. So we're now adding a new variable or property inside of this constructor called self.age, and we can set this equal to uh, a default value of zero, let's say, right? We don't know the age, so we'll just set it to zero. Now, if we come down here um, under line 49, uh, so at line 50, and we want to access or set this variable, just like we did for eye color. We can say patrick.age equals, and then we can give it some integer value. So we're storing an integer value in the constructor, so we can override it with an integer value here as well. And now we can go ahead and um, instead of printing just the eye color, we can make a print statement that gives us a little bit more information. So we can say print eye color equals and then the eye color and then we can add age equals and then patrick dot age and if we click play we get eye color equals green age equals 38. if we do the same thing for sarah so i'm going to just copy these under line 54 and then we can change this to sarah and then these two instance names as well to Sarah, referring to the instance Sarah. Um, and then we'll change Sarah's age to 44. And then we don't need this print Sarah's eye color because we have that stored inside of this print statement. And now when I click play, um, we could even change this one step further and say eye color equals and Patrick's age equals and then Sarah's eye color equals Sarah's age equals. So now when we click play, we see Patrick's eye color is green, Patrick's age is 38, but Sarah's eye color is brown and Sarah's age is 44. So we have those unique properties stored in each of those classes. If we don't know what the default value should be for any of these class uh, constructs, since we, we might not know Patrick's age or Sarah's age when we first, uh, when we first construct this class. If that is the case, we can always just give it a value of none to start. And when we click play, we override that none value, right? So when we call and store information in both of those properties, we override that none value for each instance of the class. It then gives it some value. So here we're giving it green and 38 and brown and 44 stored inside of that particular instance of the class. And then we can print out those properties. Another way of doing this um, that's maybe a little bit cleaner or uh, easier than, than calling a particular property outside of the class like we're doing here um, is to just input it into this constructor function so that instead of starting with none, we can start with the exact value relative to the instance of the class. So we'll take a look at how we do that um, by just copying all of this. You can comment that out and then add that in the lines below. Okay, so we won't be needing the access here to these uh, properties, but instead we're going to feed them into our constructor function. Um, so this is pretty similar to when we were going through functions. Uh, to feed in data, we first need a reference to the data that's coming in. So in our definition, we need some reference, let's call it underscore i underscore color and then comma underscore age and now we can take that underscore i color override the none underscore age override the none for age and we now have two inputs now in our class instanti instantiation on line 75 and 80 we have no inputs given 
So we should get an error if we hit play that says takes exactly three arguments, one given. Now, if you're paying attention here, you'll notice that we really have two variables that we want to feed in. And then our third one is just the, the reference to the class itself. So it's saying takes exactly three arguments. So that's one, two, and three. But then here it says one given. That's because we already have that reference to self by default given when we instantiate the class. So that means we don't need to refer to self when we feed in data. So although it takes in three variables, we can basically just skip that self because it happens automatically referring to itself. And now all we need is to input those two variables, eye color and age. So we're gonna just take what we were overriding here, so this green, and we're gonna set that, that value green as the eye color, and then 38 as the age. And then we can just delete both of those places where we're overriding that information. We can do the same thing for Sarah. Take the eye color input, separated by a comma, take the age input. Now this first input gets mapped to the second input of the constructor, as I mentioned, because self has already been taken care of. We get that in the error. It's telling us self has already been taken care of. So do not input self. So just need to input eye color, then we need to input age. So green, 38, brown, 44. So we're feeding in those properties and now we can hit play and print. And again, we get the exact same message, but in significantly fewer lines of code. Okay, now again, I'm gonna just copy this and then comment. Now we can paste that back in. So not only can we store properties inside of a class, but if you think of uh, the kind of idea of the class of humans, what, what else can we do? Um, or maybe I should say, uh, you know, what do we do relative to what we are? So right now we've just defined what, what we are or properties that you know, we contain. So let's say eye color and age or any number of properties uh, that we that we may have, and, and then we can store particular values for those relative to each instance or each name of that class, uh, like Patrick has certain properties. So another thing we can do though, is store actually the methods or functions that this particular class can perform. So think of it like, um, you know, a human can drink water, right? So we, we get thirsty, we need, we need to eat so we can maybe drink water and eat food. So let's think of it like this. So how would we build the uh, actions, so perform certain actions or functions you might call them to satisfy needs or properties. So I'm gonna say instead of the or, we'll just replace that with in parentheses, kind of giving ourselves a hint almost like pseudocode. Um, so perform certain functions or actions to satisfy needs, also known as properties, right? These are things that we've already talked about. So function, properties, giving us a hint. So properties like hunger and thirst. So we know that we you know, have those, we, we need to satisfy them somehow. Um, well, what do we do when we're thirsty? Uh, we can drink water, right? or drink something, some substance, doesn't have to be water, I suppose. Um, and when we're hungry, we can eat something, right? So if we keep it as simple as that, we know that we then have a property hunger that we have to satisfy. So we can say a property is defined in our constructor. This is gonna be called self dot, so refer to ourself, self dot. And then we can just give this a Boolean value of hungry. And by default, we can say, yes, we are hungry. It's true, we are hungry. Then we can also say self.thirsty equals true. So when we start out and instantiate a class, the class is gonna be hungry, right? So we're hungry and we're thirsty. Those are two true statements, we're hungry and thirsty. 
Now, what if we want to do something about that? Well, one thing we can do is nest inside of here a function so that this class can take care of that, right? So it can perform some action to satisfy that need or change that property. So we'll build a function here, this time not being an init or constructor function, so it doesn't run by default when we instantiate it, we have to give a separate call to this, which we'll come back to in a moment. So we'll make a function, and uh, this is going to mirror some of the functions we can perform, again, to satisfy that need. So def eat. And just like in the init function, any function inside of a class, if we want to be able to use the reference to that class, meaning we want to refer to properties in the class, we need to feed in self. If we don't feed in self, we cannot refer to any of these properties that we've stored in our constructor. So we need to place self in here. Even if we don't feed in any other variables, we need to feed in self to refer to that property self. So inside of here, we're gonna say, um, when we eat, right? So when we call this function, we're no longer hungry. So how could we say that? We could just change that property hungry equal to false. It's not true, we're not hungry anymore. So it's false, we're not hungry. Now, just to give us some uh, visual input, the computer's okay with just the Boolean change, but uh, for our human minds, we need a print statement to tell us what's going on. So I'm gonna say print as well, and we're gonna say print I am full now. Okay, now what if we wanna do the same thing for our thirst? How do you satisfy thirst? Well, you can drink. And similarly, we need to define that function with an input of self to refer to the property itself or the class itself uh, to refer to its individual properties. And now if we want to do something with that property thirsty, we can set that equal to false when we drink and say print I am not thirsty anymore. Because we've satisfied that, we changed it to false because we're performing the action to drink. Okay, now if we just hit play, we don't see those print statements. That's because by default, our constructor runs, but any other functions inside of a class need to be called outside of the class. So in order to do that, we need a reference. So a reference to, let's say, Patrick, and we need to say, Patrick dot, not a property, but we can also refer to methods or functions inside of the class using the same uh, kind of call that we're doing to the property. So Patrick dot eye color, Patrick dot age. We can also say Patrick dot eat. This is like when we used math dot sign parentheses, right? We were calling a method in the class math referring to that particular function or method inside of that class. So just like that, we can say patrick.eat, open and close parentheses. Then we can also say patrick.drink, right? And now if we click play, we see it print out the information about each of those instances. And then we see it also print out, I am full now, I am not thirsty anymore. We could even say, uh, in the constructor, print, and here let's say print, um, I am hungry, and print, I am thirsty, to let us know that uh, these two instances are gonna be hungry. So we're getting, I am hungry, I am thirsty, and then we're seeing the information print out about uh, Patrick's particular eye color and age. And then we're seeing, uh, now Sarah says, I am hungry, I am thirsty. And we get information about Sarah's eye color and age. And then we're only seeing one printout of each because we're only referring or only calling the two methods, eat and drink for Patrick. So Patrick is now full and Patrick is not thirsty anymore. Sarah is still both hungry and thirsty. So we haven't satisfied that need for Sarah. If we wanted to do that, we would need to say, Sarah, you can eat too, and you can also drink too. Now play. Ah, great. They're both satisfied. They've both eaten and uh, drinking enough. 
Okay. So if we wanted to make this a little bit maybe more realistic, let's say, uh, to the kind of act of eating or drinking, it's not such a binary or, uh, you know, Boolean thing. It's not a true or false. We can be on a spectrum of hunger. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'll copy all of this again, comment it out, and then we'll just paste this down below. Okay, so we have this as our starting point. Um, so if we wanted to make a spectrum of hunger, we wouldn't want these uh, property values to be true or false. We would want them to be, let's say, an integer value. So let's say 10, as in um, 10 out of 10 hunger levels. Right, so we'll start with a default of 10 out of 10 hunger levels, and then we'll start with a default of 10 out of 10 thirst levels. And we can change this to, um, not that it they are hungry and thirsty, because it's not a Boolean anymore, but just hunger and thirst, because it's the hunger and thirst levels. Now, instead of saying print I am hungry, we can say, um, I am, let's say I am self.hunger, comma, and then out of 10 level hunger, exclamation. Okay, and then we can do the same thing here. Instead of saying print I am thirsty, we can say, self.thirst, referring to that level that we've input there. I am, so we'll get in that input 10 out of 10 level thirst. Okay, so if we start there and then hit play, so we'll see it saying I am 10 out of 10 level hunger, I am 10 out of 10 level thirst for both of those instances. But then now they're saying I am full, I am not thirsty anymore. But that's still the Boolean value. Um, and actually, I guess that's still working because even though we haven't constructed that in the constructor, we still have that variable running um, and being stored or set inside of our uh, class and the print statements inside of our functions and the print statement still works. So that's why we're not getting an error even though we've changed those two variables up at the top. But if we want to refer to the particular uh, variables or properties that we're storing in our constructor, Instead of just flipping this to false, we can say if self.hunger is greater than zero, print I am still hungry. Else, so if it hits zero, then print I am full now. No more, please, because we don't want we don't want this class we don't want this instance uh, to eat anymore if they're if they're too full. So once once their hunger gets to zero, they're satisfied and they don't need to eat anymore. So we can do the same structure um, for the thirst as well. So not uh, flipping it to a boolean value, but say if self dot thirst is greater than zero, print I am still. Thirsty, oops, making some spelling errors there. Thirsty. Okay, I am still thirsty. Else, so if it gets to zero, print, I am all hydrated. No more, please. To tell us that it's totally satisfied and doesn't need to drink anymore because it. We've already satisfied that need. Okay, now we could just leave this here. The issue is we don't actually have that value changing, so it would just always be hungry and thirsty because we're not impacting that, right? That value stays at 10. So like we did in the functions and the loops, we what we did there is that we would count down or up, so this condition at some point is no longer met. So since we start at a level of 10, Every time we eat, our hunger goes down, right? So every time we call the function eat, we want to say self.hunger 
minus equals 1. And why are we nesting this action inside of this conditional and not outside? Well, because we could call to eat constantly, but if we're already satisfied, we don't want to eat anymore, right? If we've had too much, then we don't, we don't want to just keep eating. We want to say, no, I'm full now, no more please, do not change that variable anymore. But if we are still hungry, then we do want to actually consume that food, changing our hunger value minus one, so we step down in hunger. We can do the same thing for thirst as well. So self.thirst minus equals one, meaning every time we call that function, we're gonna step that value down one time. So if we now click play, well, what we're seeing is I am 10 out of 10 level hunger for both. And then we're seeing I am still hungry, I am still thirsty two times. So both of them are still hungry and thirsty. Why are they still hungry and thirsty? Because we've only called that one time each. If we called this 10 times, let's see, 77. Let's do one extra one. Click play. We see at a certain point, it says, I am full now, no more please. I am full now, no more please. Um, but we also see that our thirst, since we haven't called that 10 times, um, we're still thirsty. But for two times, we are full now, uh, so we no longer need to eat, right? So I'm so hungry, I'm so hungry, until we're satisfied, and then I'm full now, no more please. What's another way of calling this um, each individual time? Well, we could just nest this into a for loop. So for i in range, let's say 12, so that we can get beyond that uh, threshold of 10. So 12 times we're gonna call to eat and drink for both of these. And now when we click play, we should see them say, I'm still hungry and thirsty, hungry and thirsty, hungry and thirsty. <clears throat> but then we see two steps where they're satisfied and they don't need anymore, right? So here, we're full and uh, we're all hydrated two times. So that's both instances of the class have been satisfied for two steps. Um, so they ate enough, drank enough that they are fine. Another way that we can make this a little bit more realistic is by actually not setting that every single instance is going to be 10 out of 10 hungry. What if, um, let's say, what if, you know, Patrick just ate lunch, but Sarah hasn't had any lunch. So she's maybe a little bit hungry than Patrick right, then we might want to give that information into our class. And when we call the function, and when we instantiate that class, instead of just giving eye color and age, we might also want to give a hunger level. So we need to add some variables in our constructor if we want to set those inside of here. So we can give a hunger level and a thirst level. And then we can take both of those inputs. So hunger level, and we can override that 10 out of 10. And then we have thirst, which we can input into the self.thirst property. So we're, we're taking those values in and storing them as a particular property under just this instance. Now we need to input two inputs inside of uh, our, our instantiation here. So we need to give two values to satisfy that input of hunger and thirst. So let's say we just ate. So uh, we're not very hungry. We're only about a three out of 10, but we haven't had any water today. So we're at, we're at 10 out of 10, 10 out of 10 thirst. And uh, Sarah hasn't eaten anything. So uh, she's a 10 out of 10 for hunger, but uh, she's been drinking water pretty consistently. So she's only a four out of 10 for uh, that thirst. Okay, now if we come down to this uh, loop, we can still be calling uh, eat and drink, but maybe we want to take Sarah out of that initial range and give her her own that's maybe more appropriate to the uh, values that we have set. So um, we can also split up the eat and drink. So instead of looping through for i in range 12, we could say 
Um, for I in range, and then whatever, some relation to our hunger value. So if we said, since it's out of 10 and we're trying to step down, if we said uh, whatever our hunger value is, so three, we could say for I in range, not self, but Patrick dot hunger. And then for drink, we could say for I in range, Patrick dot thirst. And this is gonna be exactly the right amount to satisfy their needs. Um, here, I'm gonna just comment those two lines out and we can comment out as well those. Okay, so now we're just seeing the eat and drink printout and we can hit play. I am three out of 10 level hunger. I am 10 out of 10 level thirst um, and then 10 out of 10 level hunger, four out of 10 level thirst for Sarah. I'm still hungry, I'm still thirsty all the way through. Okay, so what it looks like we need is actually a plus one um, in order to loop through one extra time uh, to actually satisfy that. We're getting to just before that point, so we're going all the way down to uh, one, but we weren't actually going beyond one, um, all the way to zero to be able to print that satisfaction statement. Um, now we could just copy and paste this but then change these values to Sarah and use the instance Sarah instead of Patrick. And we could even give ourselves more information than just I am still hungry and thirsty and we could say I am still and then add self.hunger And we could do the same thing for uh, thirsty. I am still self.thirst, thirsty. Now, if we hit play, we say, I am still too hungry, or we could say two out of 10, but too hungry. Um, I am still one hungry, I am still zero hungry. And we can go through um, all the way down until each are satisfied. One last thing that we're gonna do in this introduction video, um, if we wanted to, make this more even more realistic, we might not just, you know, want to immediately satisfy um, each of these particular instances of the class. Let's say we only had a certain amount of food. So we had food equals, and then we can make a list here. Let's say we have um, some steak, some pasta, some soup, some salad, Okay, so we only have that much food. So I'm gonna now not loop through um, everything until we're satisfied, but I'm gonna only loop through for I in range length food because we only have that much food. Let's imagine that there are two servings of each, right? So for I in range length food, Patrick eats and Sarah eat. Then we can maybe say, um, we can either use this, this printout inside of here as they eat to let us know. Um, or yeah, let's, let's start there at least. Um, but there are additional ways obviously that we could do this where maybe just at the end, we check if they've eaten enough or whether we need to harvest more food, uh, or somehow, you know, purchase more food. Um, so if I click play, Ah, we're missing a parentheses there. Make sure that we always close out our parentheses when we open them, so hit play. Now it says, I am three out of 10 level hunger for Patrick, 10 out of 10 thirst, 10 out of 10 level hunger for Sarah. So as we're looping through, we say uh, patrick.eat. So patrick.eat um, goes from I am still too hungry, but Sarah is still nine hungry. Then Patrick is one, Sarah is eight, Patrick is zero, Sarah is seven. So then Patrick says, I'm all full now, no more please, but Sarah is still hungry. So we can see that with that food supply, we've satisfied one of these uh, people, one of these instances of the class, but not the other.
So this is all for the introduction to classes. Hopefully this analogy is helpful in understanding some of the kind of principles behind classes inside of Python um, and the way that we might kind of refer to them or build up definitions within them. Um, the, the power of classes is really incredible. And in the two exercise videos, we'll see some of that related to um, things happening inside of Rhino. And these are kind of historical examples of how to use classes the first being linked in Xant, and the second being cellular automata. And in these, I may also go over a little bit of how to structure a basic Lindenmeyer growth system. That's all, and I'll see you in the next video.